Rocket Lab announced that it will self-fund the development and launch of a small spacecraft that will send a tiny probe flying through the clouds of Venus. The mission's goal is to search for organic chemicals in the Venusian clouds and explore their habitability. Rocket Lab's Electron rocket will launch the spacecraft into a 165 km orbit above Earth, where the rocket's photon upper stage will carry out a series of burns to boost the spacecraft's orbit and speed until it reaches escape velocity. Assuming a May 2023 launch, the spacecraft would reach Venus in October 2023. After arriving, Photon would send a tiny 20 kg probe into the Venusian atmosphere. The probe is approximately 40 cm in diameter and has a 45-degree half-angle sphere cone blunt body with a hemispherical aft section for stability. The spacecraft will feature a 1 kg scientific payload consisting of an autofluorescing nephelometer, which is an instrument to detect suspended particles in the clouds. The probe will spend about 5 minutes and 30 seconds falling through the upper atmosphere at an altitude of 45 to 60 kilometers, and then it will ideally keep sending data as it falls further toward the surface. Venus, our closest planetary neighbor, is quite similar to Earth in size, and past research suggests that it was once habitable like our planet. According to previous NASA studies, Venus could have had shallow oceans on the surface for 2 to 3 billion years, and this would have supported temperatures of between 20 to 50 degrees Celsius. However, a resurfacing event around 700 million years ago spewed carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, transforming Venus into a hazardous and hostile planet with temperatures reaching more than 500 degrees Celsius. In September 2020, scientists at MIT and Cardiff University announced that they had found what might be evidence of life in Venus's clouds. However, since its release, the study has drawn much criticism. Rocket Lab's mission to Venus, which is supported by a research team at MIT, will help gather further evidence on the September 2020 discovery. While there have been 46 Venus missions to date, Rocket Labs will be the first private exploration of the planet. Moreover, no private company has yet sent a spacecraft directly to another planet in the solar system. According to Rocket Lab, the mission will be the first opportunity to directly examine Venus's cloud particles in nearly four decades. After a roughly 10-hour voyage from the Vehicle Assembly Building, the massive space launch system Mega Moon rocket, topped with the Orion crew capsule, arrived at NASA's Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39B on Wednesday morning. The 98-meter-tall rocket is scheduled to embark on its uncrewed Artemis 1 mission to the moon as early as August 29, with September 2 and 5 as backup days. The mission will see the Orion spacecraft flying around the moon and then returning to Earth over the course of 39 to 42 days. It will be a crucial long-delayed demonstration trip to the moon for NASA's Artemis program, the United States' multibillion-dollar effort to return humans to the lunar surface. The main objectives of the Artemis 1 mission are to evaluate the integrated system performance of Orion and the SLS rocket, and to ensure the spacecraft can safely carry astronauts toward the moon and return them back to Earth. To understand the risks of space radiation, as well as to develop countermeasures, Artemis 1 is carrying several payloads for scientists. Among them is the STEMRAD radiation vest, which will be worn by one of two dummy torsos on the Orion spacecraft to measure the radiation environment. Munikan Campos, a test dummy that is now fastened to the commander's seat of the Orion spacecraft, will give NASA scientists crucial information on what future human crew members may experience during flight. In addition to sending Orion on its journey around the moon, SLS will carry 10 CubeSats that will perform their own science and technology investigations. In the coming days, engineers and technicians will configure the SLS rocket and the surrounding pad for launch. I will be doing a dedicated video on the Artemis 1 mission soon, so be sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications. A Russian spacewalk outside the International Space Station was cut short on August 17 after a cosmonaut experienced an electrical problem with his spacesuit. Cosmonauts Oleg Artemyev and Denis Matveev left the ISS on Wednesday for a routine spacewalk to work on the station's European robotic arm. It was the seventh spacewalk for Artemyev and the third for Matveev. A little more than two hours into what was meant to be a nearly seven-hour spacewalk, Artemyev's spacesuit unexpectedly experienced a voltage fluctuation in its battery power. I have a message, voltage low. The Russian cosmonaut was then repeatedly ordered to drop what he was working on and head back to the airlock of the space station. Alec, you must return to the airlock as soon as possible, because if you lose power, it is not only the pump and the fan, you will lose comb, so you have to go back. 
Ну, Олег, this is Соловьев. Drop everything and start going back right away. So, Олег, go back and connect to station power. Immediate return to airlock and connect to station power. Affirmative connect to station power. Okay, Oleg, please start going back. Fortunately, Artemyev was able to return safely to the Poisk airlock on the Russian portion in time, and according to NASA mission control, he was never in any danger. Cosmonaut Matviev remained just outside the airlock for more than an hour until flight controllers decided to end the spacewalk early. The primary goal of Wednesday's spacewalk was to install two cameras on the new European robotic arm, which is attached to the exterior of the Russian-controlled portion of the space station. Artemyev and Matviev had successfully mounted the cameras on the robotic arm before their excursion was cut short. The two cosmonauts were also charged with moving the arm's external control panel and testing a rigidizing mechanism that will be employed to make it easier to grab payloads. These goals are now postponed until a future spacewalk. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. Last week was a no-test week for SpaceX at Starbase. All the scheduled road closures for last week were cancelled, and Starship 24 has been idle at suborbital launch pad B for the past few days. However, teams were spotted working on the ship throughout the week, preparing the prototype, which has already completed two static fire tests, for the next round of tests. Ship 24's next round of testing, most probably a six-engine static fire test, will happen as early as Monday, August 22. Meanwhile, Super Heavy Booster 7, which had completed two static fire tests, including a long-duration static fire, was removed from the orbital launch mount and transported back to the production site on August 12. SpaceX has already begun installing the 13 inner Raptor engines of the booster. Once the engines, shrouds, and the blast and heat protection shields that will protect the Raptors from themselves are in place, the prototype will be transported to the launch site to continue the static fire test campaign. Zach Golden of CSI Starbase recently brought to our attention a major Raptor upgrade that most of us have overlooked. The Raptor redesign, visible in this image captured by Starship Gazer, was only revealed when Booster 7 was lifted two weeks ago for stacking on the orbital launch mount. Let's go over this redesign in detail. SpaceX uses high-pressure helium gas to spin up the turbopumps of the Raptor engines during the engine start sequence. The helium required for this process is usually stored in composite overwrapped pressure vessels, or COPVs. All six of the Starship's engines are capable of restarting when needed, therefore, it is essential to install COPVs filled with high-pressure helium on ships to restart the engines whenever necessary. This will increase the total mass of the rocket. In the case of Super Heavy Boosters, the outer 20 engines have no restart capability. If the helium-filled COPVs that are required to spin-start the outer engines during liftoff are mounted on the booster, the vehicle has to carry those empty pressure vessels throughout its journey. The dead weight of those pressure vessels will impose a limitation on the maximum velocity that the booster can achieve. If SpaceX could eliminate these COPVs and supply the helium required by the outer engines from an external source, it will reduce the total mass of the booster considerably. So, SpaceX came up with a clever plan to use 20 quick disconnect mechanisms that were put on the orbital launch mount to provide the helium to the outer engines. The quick disconnect mechanism resides near the booster hold-down clamps on the launch mount, and SpaceX has tested this QD system several times before. The outer engines of the booster have a panel with ports installed on it to connect with the quick disconnect mechanisms. Along with the helium required to spin-start the turbopumps, the QD mechanism will also supply nitrogen required for engine chill and purge, and gaseous methane and oxygen required for engine ignition. It was this QD panel that SpaceX redesigned when it transitioned from the first-generation Raptor engines to the second-generation engines. All the six ports that supply high-pressure gases have been repositioned, and an additional port has been added to the QD system. Moreover, the ports now appear to be smaller in size, compared to the previous design. Until now, Elon Musk hasn't explained why SpaceX chose to alter the quick disconnect mechanism. To adapt to this Raptor design change, SpaceX engineers have been redesigning the orbital launch mount for the past several months, and that work is still continuing. A huge shout-out to Zach Golden for pointing out this Raptor design change. Make sure to check out the CSI Starbase channel for Starship deep dive videos. Link in the description.
On August 18, Sky Perfect JSAT, a Japanese corporate group that describes itself as Asia's largest satellite communication and multi channel pay TV company, announced that they had signed a launch service contract with SpaceX to launch the company's Superbird 9 satellite on a Starship launch vehicle. This was the first public announcement of a SpaceX Starship satellite launch contract. Superbird 9 is a fully flexible high throughput satellite that will primarily serve Japan and Eastern Asia with broadcast and internet missions in the KU band. The satellite will be based on Airbus's reconfigurable payload satellite bus, OneSat, which can steer and reassign beams for different customers and services. Superbird 9, which will weigh approximately 3,000 kilograms, will be launched into geosynchronous transfer orbit by Starship in 2024. The Starship cargo vehicle that will deploy the Superbird satellite into orbit will differ from the one that will place Starlink satellites into orbit. SpaceX is currently planning to use a PEZ dispenser-like satellite deployer mechanism to deploy Starlink satellites into orbit. But to deploy the comparatively massive and larger Superbird satellite into orbit, SpaceX must design a cargo Starship with a new kind of payload bay. The Starship rocket catching and stacking arm, which suffered a hydraulic failure two weeks ago, has been repaired by SpaceX teams. After fixing it, SpaceX tested the horizontal and vertical movements of the tower arms. Teams have recently completed installing hydraulic actuators on the tower arms. These actuators will act as shock absorbers during a rocket catch attempt. Given that the teams have been rapidly upgrading the tower arms over the past several weeks, we can assume that SpaceX will most likely catch Booster 7 from mid-air during the orbital test flight. At the build site, teams have recently stacked the nose cone of Ship 25 on top of the payload bay section. The methane downcomer of Ship 25 was installed into the oxygen tank section on August 12. The remaining sections will be stacked to complete the prototype assembly in the coming weeks. On Monday evening, at Kennedy Space Center, SpaceX moved the seventh section of the Starship Orbital Launch Tower from SpaceX's operations area at Roberts Road to Launch Complex 39A. Teams are currently extending the crane at Pad 39A to lift and stack the seventh section on top of the sixth section. The stacking operation will commence soon. The short 8th section and the ninth and final roof section of the tower are currently being prefabricated at Roberts Road. A new Starship production tent is also rising on the site. SpaceX has begun delivering parts of a brand new custom-built crane to Kennedy Space Center to assist Starship operations at Pad 39A. A similar crane is currently active at Starbase. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.